Hey ho, Tudor minded people. I'm Gage. I'm Jessica. We're Tudor Time Machine, and this is episode nine of our podcast. Thank you for listening. Every episode, Jesse will read from Time's Riddle, a story project we're working on. We've had such a great time researching it and bringing it to you. And if you're like us and love thinking about how history connects to now, stick around because after the reading, we'll be discussing some of the historical facts and research that went into today's chapter. At this point in our story, Constance is in the service of the Swedish princess Cecilia Vasa. She and Philomena are searching for the writer of the anonymous letter found at the Arundel Inn. So read on, Jesse. Chapter 9, The Arundel Inn, in which the Earl of Surrey's mistress maid Alice tells her tale. Philomena was striding back and forth on the frozen grass behind the inn, wondering if she could possibly squeeze in a tennis court. The king's head was doing a roaring trade with the one they had just put in. Philomena imagined her guests playing long games, and there would be profit to be made on the sustenance needed to keep up their energy. The license to put in a court would cost her something, not to mention the building expenses, but in the end it would be worth it. Sounds the space was small, she considered. It was at least three arm's lengths short. Perhaps she should take out one of the stables. Across the grounds, Philomena recognized Alice Flanner making her way into the kitchen. The servant had been away for the last week attending her daughter in childbirth. Alice's figure offered inspiration. Philomena had found no discoveries to share with sweet Constance Stoner. But Alice had been with her mother for years, and probably had more intimate knowledge than anyone else of the courtiers who had sojourned at the inn. She might know who the beaded box belonged to. "'Alice, you have returned,' Philomena hailed her. "'Mistress of Rundle. Alice clutched Philomena's hand to her chest and kissed it wetly. I have heard your mother has gone. Alas, if I had been here, I would not have let the dear lady go away without me to care for her. Such a one as Mistress Millicent is. What friendliness to all. But my daughter Angus had a baby, such a dumpling. And God save us, my girl is in good health. But Oh, what a time she had. Two days of thrashing and screaming, like the harrowing of hell it was. I thought she would die from it. By God, what a curse Eve brought on women. Alice went on with her account of the bloody battle of labour, while Philomena guided her into her chamber. Struggling to capture her attention, Philomena thrust the box at her. Alice, dear heart, do you know who this belonged to? The servant went quiet and began to examine it, her eyes fixed on the smiling lion. Her fingers traced the beadwork. She opened it, peered inside, and looked through the papers. She closed the box and held it to her heart, taking great gulps of air as if she were a fish dying on the land. Startled, Philomena said, Alice, Alice, be easy. Sit here. Take it, mistress, take it back. God forgive me, I cannot bear to look on it. Philomena took the box as Alice fell into the offered bench, panting and shaking her head as if she might faint. Your mother, she never blamed me. Now you bring it back to haunt me, mistress. But his ghost, he haunts me every night. Oh, heaven. Oh, hell. Alice, dear, you have done no wrong. The Earl of Surrey, Henry Howard, God does not blame me for that, do you think? Alice began to heave. Of course, the Earl of Surrey, Henry Howard, Philomena recalled the name. Her mother had mentioned this peer with pride. There was logic to the situation. Henry Howard had been a well-known Catholic and a lauded peer. The Earl of Surrey? Alice, was this his? Philomena pressed. Alice was almost prostrate on the bench now, her response smothered by her mouth being smashed against the wood. Philomena fought the desire to shake her. Instead, she gently pulled Alice back to a sitting position and took her hand. The grandest, the grandest sweet in the place, Alice gulped. The Earl paid me a little mind. Such a fine fellow. The highest peer in the realm. A Plantagenet blood. A claim to the throne he had indeed. I said to the butcher, I did that. That the Earl deserved the best joint of lamb as he might himself be king one day. What a foolish girl I was. Earl was in the ship with Henry. He went off to war to put it all right. I was so happy to see him return, but then they all turned against him. 
the Plantagenet arms over the bed. I made up that bed every day. Alice, Philomena said, I cannot understand you. Mistress, I knew when I spoke what I said to the butcher. It all came back again the day they took him away. Treason, they called it, looking for the death of the king. All because of the Plantagenet arms and what I said to the butcher. Enough of the butcher. Alice, dear, why was the box left at the inn? The Earl of Surrey gave that box to your mother. She was big with you in her belly. We were all crying. Why to her, Alice? Why would he give it to my mother? Alice massaged her neck as if she feared for it and inhaled deeply. I do not know. I do not know. I fell at his feet begging for forgiveness. He said it was not my fault. I kissed his hand. Joan led me away. I fainted in her arms. Who is Joan, Alice? Philomena leapt on the name. They took him to the tower. He looked so noble, proud. He went with his head high and then they sliced it off. Oh, I was his end. It was me. I was his end. Hell, mistress, I'm going to be sick. Philomena grabbed a jug off the table and shoved it under Alice's chin. The poor woman heaved and tears began to snake down her face. How awful. You are not to blame, Alice. You are a saint to say it, mistress. A saint. (laughs) Two tankards of wine and three soggy handkerchiefs later, Philomena was able to extract Joan's surname, Whitnall, and her whereabouts, a wig maker's in Silver Street. The Earl of Surrey had written the letter and another, hopefully less histrionic servant, might remember some juicy bits. Puffed up like a peacock, triumphant, Philomena ran down the stairs to find her page, Harry, to deliver a message to Constance. The boy was not in the kitchen. The drinking room was a likely place. As she crossed the room, she saw Blackjack sitting with a tankard. He was looking rakish and overtired. He had probably been womanizing, but perhaps not. He was a favorite of the inn, and she should treat him as such. Sir, Blackjack, you have been off, having a merry time, I warrant. You have a hunter's eyes, sir. Have you seen my postboy, Harry? Blackjack was flooded with satisfaction. He had starved Philomena of his presence, and thankfully she had noticed. I'm loath to tell you, mistress, where he is, as you will rush off on some business as soon as he is found. Sir, I am the innkeeper. Madame, I am a guest who needs attending. Very well. I will attend you once I dispatch this message. Philomena gave him her hand. It was pleasant to have him hold it for a moment. I don't know how you cannot see him yourself, Philomena. The boy is asleep under the table. Her message off to Constance, Philomena decided she could spend time with Blackjack in this public place. That would ease any discomfort between them. She would sit with him as any good innkeeper might with such an excellent client. Sir Ralph raised his tankard from the opposite table. Mistress Arundel, ignore that maidenly man at arms, Sir Black Knave. I will provide you better company. Blackjack rose. He would be damned if this fat-head sot would steal his moment. He had spent several days drunk in Drury Lane to forward his plot to make Philomena notice him. Always toward absent lovers, love's tide stronger flows, his cunning friend young Nathaniel Bacon had advised. And he had taken that advice. He hated waiting, and he had waited, and he would not lose now. He opened his mouth to speak, but Philomena cut him off. I could never choose between two such gallants, she said judiciously. Sir Ralph, join us here. Alack, I would as soon sit with a tankard of wine on the house, and you may sit this one time with Sir Blacksmith, a ruffian in socks and fine linen. Philomena nodded a servant over to the old knight and slid onto a stool next to Blackjack. What have you, sir? More newfangled floatsome? You laugh at me. I know these are the things you prize most. Not true. There are things I prize more. But look here. Blackjack unwrapped a package and displayed what looked like two little sticks. What do they do? Philomena asked. Blackjack began to sketch with the sticks. He was practiced, she thought. A rounded cheek developed on the page. And then she saw an eye she recognized. She glanced up to see Blackjack measure her face with his thumb. You draw well, sir. I am inspired. Beauty guides my hand. While not fresh for her, Philomena well knew, his tone was pleasing. She felt herself blush as he moved a little closer to her. La, how silly she was to let him unsettle her so. He liked all the ladies, she would be a fool to take it to heart. All thought him handsome, and he craved the attention. He ate it up. She would not oblige. Philomena plucked the sticks from his hand. 
With uneven strokes, she drew a horse's arse. Is that me? Blackjack asked. Only if you recognise yourself in my picture. Blackjack liked banter, but they had more to say to each other than this. He wearied of her letting her guard down only to once again repel his interest. She was getting up. Lady, I have not finished. Philomena looked at him quizzically. Do you not see Cuthbert here? Her new steward bowed. Sir John, my interruption, though unpleasant, perhaps, is entirely warranted. Cuthbert was a simpering man, Blackjack thought, overcome with the good fortune of his mistress dismissing the last steward. Cuthbert's son, Falk, always at his side, was homely with a chin that jutted and crusty eyes. Blackjack sucked in some wine as the two men talked to Philomena about something boring and money-related. She tilted her head away from him, and he found her neck lovely as it curved into her shoulders. She was not speckish, but a woman of presence, commanding the space she stood in. He studied her figure, picturing the smooth skin under the heavy cloth of her dress, a tiny birthmark to discover, a freckle on the inside of her thigh. She was moving away from him, calling for gloves and a fur cloak. Philomena, where do you go? he asked. The tennis court surveyors have arrived. He followed her to the site, listening to the talk of the cost of tennis courts. The weather was cold, but the wind did not bite. And he lounged about, imagining a naked game with Philomena as she debated with the surveyor. He thanked God he did not have a trade. He dozed. She talked to her people. Philomena finally came to sit with him. But before he could speak, her postboy pounced on her. The way she took up the message riled him. Who inspired such alacrity? He would run the bastard through. He leaned over to see an unexpected name. Mistress Constance Stoner. Outrageous. He could not believe it. Philomena and a slippery papist? The duplicity of that Stoner family. Yet still, still, the queen had taken the little festering sore of a Stoner into her service. Surely Philomena had abandoned the old faith? Why make friendly dates with traitors? He would accost her. But she deposited the letter in her cloak pocket and took her place on the grass beside him. Her gloved hand lay so close, ready to take up, maybe even to kiss. He took the chance and brought her open palm to his lips. The kiss made a gentle smacking sound on the soft leather. She did not object. He did it again, and then kept her hand in his for a moment. Then confound it! She was getting up again and telling Cuthbert to have a horse made ready for her. Good day, Black Jack. Where are you off to? I have business at Bedford House. With a lady it would be better not to be associated with, Blackjack scowled. I go to speak to the Princess Cecilia Vassa about the rooms she has taken here. Does that offend you, sir? Blackjack was not content. He did not like the note from the papist, but now Philomena was walking off towards the stables, and he would not lower himself by running after her. A confrontation about Mistress Stoner would have to wait. All right, let's begin at the beginning where Philomena is measuring out a tennis court. Tennis was a game popularized by Henry VIII, although it predated the Tudors. Yes, and at this time, a few upscale inns in London had tennis courts on the property because it was a great way to attract business. You did have to obtain a license and have it built to certain specifications. It wasn't a cheap enterprise, but it was well worth it to fill your property with rich young gallants swinging rackets around and spending money. I think of it as being kind of like outfitting a sports bar with pool tables and video games. All right, moving from entertainment to a truly dangerous activity, childbirth. In our story, Alice has just come back from being with her daughter through her labor. In the 16th century, only women were admitted into the birthing room. Almost all births would have been assisted by a midwife, not a doctor. And the midwife had to be considered of good character, and she also had to take an oath not to keep any of the placenta or a bit of the umbilical cord, because it was believed that those things could be used in witchcraft. So about one in three women in the 16th century died either in childbirth itself or from some complication afterwards. Those are just staggeringly bad odds. It's true. And the thing is, the pain of the labor, the whole thing was considered the woman's own fault, a legacy from Eve's sin of eating the apple. (sighs) Yep. So the church made everyone think that men suffering and dying in battle was honorable. And yet suffering and dying in childbirth was your own damn fault for being born a woman. Mm. Ugh. It's terrible. One in three is so many women. It, It really disturbs me to think about it. And if you survived, any problem that the child had was, of course, due to something the mother did. Because, for example, it was a common belief at the time that pregnant women should avoid even thinking about something disturbing. 
being upset was thought to cause monstrous births. And monstrous births is how they called any children who had anything even slightly wrong with them. So wealthy women would have surrounded themselves with beautiful tapestries placed around the room so they would think only positive and wonderful thoughts. And some people believed that the women, what the women ate or drank could influence the sex of the child. So I imagine a lot of men who were so invested in having male heirs blamed their wives if the child was a girl. It's true. And some women worked up until the moment they gave birth. So they might have birth, you know, right there in the kitchen or in the field. Mm -hmm. And many women wrote wills because they were well aware of how dangerous it was and that they might die. Cesarean sections were very rare, but they were only performed if the mother was already dead. Right. So it was a very hard thing to go through. So as we said in one of the other podcasts, Alice Flanner was a real person who worked at the Arundel Inn for Mistress Millicent Arundel, who in our story is Philomena's mother. So the real Alice Flanner served Henry Howard, and she was deposed at his trial for treason in 1547. In the deposition, Alice stated that she was the one who made Howard's bed every morning and that she had seen the Plantagenet coats of arms above his bed. So this doesn't sound like breaking news, but in the 16th century in London, this would have upset Henry a lot. It was considered treason because Henry VIII was very paranoid about the Plantagenet claim to the throne, and this would have been seen as Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, flaunting his connection to the Plantagenets. Alice Flanner also stated in her deposition that when she went to the butcher, she chided him for giving her a bad piece of meat because the man she was buying it for, Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey, might be king one day. Again, how serious is this? But I imagine they thought she would say that because Henry Howard was running around saying that he would be king one day. So there are many other witnesses in Henry Howard's trial, but in our story, Alice feels completely responsible for his death. Of course, we don't know anything about the personality of the actual Alice Flanner. Someone of her class would never get more than a passing reference in a court trial. In fact, I think the fact that they wrote down what she said is pretty remarkable. Right, and that we still have it. Yes, because her, and her story doesn't seem very serious to convict someone on, but they thought it was quite damning. In our story, Alice is very loyal and a very good servant, but she's also quite dramatic. (laughs) Absolutely. So moving on to a nice young gentleman. We added blackjack with his pencil because pencils had just been invented in 1565, and we thought that was fun. So in our story, blackjack has his fancy gigaws, and he's sort of a bit of a 16th century techie. The pencil is cutting edge in 1565. It had just been invented in Italy, although graphite itself had been discovered earlier. The Italians were the first ones to think of attaching the graphite to a wooden stick. (laughs) It's, you know, very clever. Um, But the eraser was not added until the 19th century. So our blackjack is a well-traveled young gentleman, and he would have really prided himself on keeping up with new inventions and ideas, just like young people do today. There were many inventions from Italy and other parts of Europe that were coming to England for the first time. And actually, the world was kind of connected in terms of trade and in terms of being excited about new things, just as it is today. And Blackjack doesn't think there's anything wrong with being the man of leisure. You know, while Philomena's working and discussing finances, he's just hanging out. And that's because the upper class, they did not think... It was a good to work hard. Right. I mean, Blackjack says to himself, thank God I don't have a trade, right? He, he looked at that and thought that was not the best way of living. That was not the most noble way of living. He was a gentleman, and he didn't need to do things like that. Next time, find out what happens when Philomena goes to see Constance with this breaking news about Henry Howard, Earl of Surrey. As always, we have more information over on our Facebook page. Leave us a comment and subscribe now. Right, so see you next time. And remember to listen for more Times Riddle and more Tudor-minded talk.